Okay. Are you ready for more? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, good. Uh, had a nice lunch. Yeah. Everyone happy? Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, it's good to be happy. It's better to be happy than not to be happy. So we are, we are happy if you are happy. You are happy if I. We are happy. So great. Uh, <laughs> so I'm gonna talk a little bit more, of course, about depressing things. Uh, so be, get ready to be depressed. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the kind of the remarkable thing uh, with uh, some of these things that may seem depressing and sad on the surface uh, is that they have a very transformative ability. Uh, so the idea is to go beyond the immediate shock of having to deal with these realities of life uh, and then somehow transforming it into something very powerful on the spiritual path. Uh, and what you find, of course, is that if you do this, uh, is that instead of these things being depressing, they actually are a great source of uh, happiness, a great source of meaning, a great source of purpose, uh, a great source of turning your mind onto the spiritual path. Uh, yeah, a great source of all the good things that we're looking for in life basically come from these ideas, especially the idea of death contemplation. It's a very, very powerful contemplation. And I would recommend all of you to do this. Uh, because I can almost guarantee it will change your life, at least a little bit, perhaps a lot. How much can it change your life? Do you have any idea about that? How much it can change your life? I will give you an example. Yeah, This is maybe a bit of a cheating example, but it's a nice example anyway. And it's the example of the Buddha. Uh, remember what we are doing now, we're looking at the life of the Buddha. Yeah, We're looking at what happened to the Buddha before his awakening, what he went through. Why did the Buddha become a monk? Why did the Buddha achieve this thing we call awakening or bodhi on this uh, practice? What was the causes? And very often the things that we learn when we go to the schools, yeah, someone asked the question yesterday, but why do we have to learn about the seven steps of the Buddha when he was uh, you know, born? Why? <laughs> and it's kind of a cute question. Yeah? It was a, and it's a good question, actually a really good one. So if, even if the school children have to ask these questions, great, because sometimes when you're young, you're more inquisitive and you actually ask these questions. Uh, and when we become too old, we become too dull to remember to ask those important questions. <laughs> yeah, there's some truth to that. Children are still really kind of attuned with these things. That's the great thing about, about kids in general. Uh, so what was the thing about the Buddha? It wasn't really compassion that made the Buddha go forth. Uh, and the reason for that is obvious, because to actually feel compassion, first of all, you have to have a message, you have to have an understanding. Yeah, once you have an understanding that there is a problem, once you know what is going on, then it is natural for compassion to arise, because then you know you have a solution for people who are suffering. And if you have a solution, you want to share that solution, that is where compassion arises. So it wasn't compassion, according to the suttas, that made the Buddha to be, become a monk. This is not why he achieved awakening. The reason he achieved awakening is the things we're looking at now. Yeah. We will see this more clearly in a second. I'm just mentioning it now as well, because it comes up again in a second, how the Buddha was thinking. So the core contemplation here, because this contemplation kind of includes also sickness and old age, yeah, this contemplation of death, the core contemplation here is the contemplation of death. This is what made the Buddha go forth. This is what made him able to reach the stage of awakening. That is the potential for this sort of contemplation. Isn't that kind of extraordinary? Yeah, so these simple things in life, sometimes we become far too complicated. I know that on previous occasions here at the BGF, I have been taught teaching things like dependent origination and all these kind of things. And sometimes I think to myself, maybe I should just be teaching death contemplation instead. Forget about dependent origination. <laughs> Actually, no, I'm, I'm exaggerating. I don't think we should forget about that. But we should remember what are the critical things that really move this path, that really make it happen. And very often the simple things are far more powerful than complex ideas such as dependent origination. And the reason is because the simple things, we can relate to those. Yeah, dependent origination is a bit more difficult to relate to. It takes much more reflection, much more insight. But death is something everyone can relate to. We know what it means. It happens to every one of us. Everyone is going to have to die. Everyone is going to have to experience other people's death. We understand what it means. It's simple. And because it is simple, it is very powerful. In fact, it is so powerful, it made the Buddha who he actually was. So this is the 
why we have Buddhism in the world, we could say, because one person uh, contemplated that so profoundly, uh, that is why we have Buddhism in the present day. Uh, and this is why we have also have this opportunity to learn about the same teachings. Uh, so please don't underestimate these uh, very powerful and simple teachings. Uh, they can take you a long way. And if you use something like death contemplation in the right way, uh, it makes you a better person. Uh, it makes you have more metta in the world. It makes you have more karuna and compassion. Uh, because compassion, these good qualities arise out of this. Uh, they, it, the importance of these things becomes significant when you start to understand the importance of death. Uh, that is where these things kind of arise out of. Uh, so uh, very, very useful contemplation. And uh, when I was saying before about uh, first thing in the morning when they get out of bed to contemplate death, it, it's not entirely a joke. And not many people who do that. Uh, yeah, It actually is very useful. It sets the course for the day. Uh, and, uh, you know, <laughs> so once you get that right, it really actually has a, has a wonderful and powerful effect on your life. Uh, and so this is what this is about. Yeah, it is meant to uplift you. Huh? It meant to make you a more, a better human being. Huh? There is another contemplation that you find in the suttas. I mentioned before the five contemplations, the five themes, yeah, which is illness, old age, death. And the fourth one of those, uh, which is equally depressing. Huh? They're all very depressing. Yeah, not all, but uh, some of them are depressing. We'll come to some more happy ones later on. Huh? Uh, the fourth one is that everything, beloved and dear to me, uh, must become separated from me. Uh, yeah, and that is kind of the opposite of the contemplation of death, uh, because the contemplation of death is about our own death, uh, whereas everything that be is beloved to me must become separated uh, is about the death of other people, uh, or about ownership, or about all the things that we hold on to in the world. Uh. So it is like the flip side of the coin, uh, equally important. Uh, yeah, and um, so all of these things, they point you in a certain direction. They point you towards the unreliability of everything in the world. In fact, all of these contemplations are really anicca sannyas. They are perceptions of impermanence. Yeah, death contemplation is also a perception of impermanence. It's just a very hands-on perception of impermanence. But actually, it's a very powerful one because death is a very powerful moment of impermanence. So, um, yeah, so it turns you away from the world. You understand the unreliability of things. It turns you on to the place where you find real security. And where you find real security is the spiritual path. That is where security is to be found. One of my kind of favorite stories, I don't know if you have followed, I know some of you have uh, followed some of the teachings that we do in Perth, and uh, we do a lot of sutta readings down there. I like to do sutta readings, uh, and one of the suttas that I embarked on a long time, a few, couple of years ago, three or four years ago, was the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, yeah, the sutta on the great passing away, the, which tells the story of how the Buddha passed away. Uh, and it's a very beautiful and powerful sutta with huge amount of content. Uh, yeah, and one of the reasons why it is so powerful uh, is because the Buddha knows he's about to pass away. Uh, because he knows he's about to pass away, uh, he wants to kind of hand the Buddhist community, hand over all the last information uh, about how they're supposed to live after his passing away. Uh, yeah, everyone kind of knows the Buddha is about to pass away. You can imagine the time, what, what that is like. Yeah, imagine the Buddha passing away. Uh, I don't know who is your, your favorite teacher these days. Uh, no, Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn, I don't know who, who is your favorite, whoever it is, be. imagine your favorite teacher dying, yeah? Or maybe, maybe you have two or three favorite teachers. Uh, imagine all of those teachers dying, yeah? It feels like you feel lost, right? Because the teacher is gone. I, sometimes I think Ajahn Brahm passing away. And sometimes when I look at him, I think it may not be that long. And when I see him, <laughs> when I see what he eats and kind of his lack of eggs, I think, oh no, Ajahn, please, please don't, don't do this. But if you ask him, he just he does more of it, so you can't really ask him. Huh? <laughs> so he, he, he is not concerned about dying at all. Huh? But uh, so, and I think, well, if Ajahn Brahm dies, uh, yeah, Ajahn Brahm is like this pillar. Yeah, he kind of stands there and he's immovable. Yeah, he's like an immovable pillar in us, in kind of in the world. Uh, and this is kind of the power of someone who is practiced really well. They are very immovable. They're very solid. They are independent of all the winds and all the kind of conditions in the world. They stand like a rock. Yeah? Ajahn Brahm is a bit like a rock. Yeah? 
If you try to manipulate Ajahn Brahm, he kind of stands there. Nothing, nothing really happens. So, <laughs> so uh, and when and, and that is very nice to have like a rock or a pillar in your midst because you can always rely on that pillar. Yeah, you can always kind of stand there. And I go to Ajahn Brahm and ask him, ask him for an opinion. Uh, and usually it is really good advice. Maybe not every time. <laughs> sometimes I may disagree with Ajahn Brahm, but it's good to disagree sometimes. Yeah? Don't believe everything you hear from me either. You disagree, please. And, um, but it's kind of some, someone who is always there, always available. Yeah? Like the Buddha was available. Ajahn Brahm is like a kind of smaller version maybe of that or something like that. And the idea of Ajahn Brahm being gone is kind of... A, it's a powerful thought, yeah. And I, and I, sometimes I think, okay, my first thought is, okay, I, I get a bit of Ajahn Brahm to eat some more vegetables. That's kind of my first thought, yeah. But then I, I realize, actually, you can't do that with Ajahn Brahm. You can't change Ajahn Brahm. Yeah, he is who he is. Actually, it's my problem. Yeah, it's not his problem. It's my problem. I am the one who has a problem because I can't deal with impermanence, for goodness sake. Yeah? And then I realize I got to deal with this. I have to change my outlook. Yeah? I have to get my act together. I have to be more firm, more independent, more kind of being able to deal with these kind of things. Yeah. And that is really the answer to all of these things. And so in the biography of the Buddha, in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, when the Buddha is to pass away, you can imagine the Buddha is like a thousand times like someone like Ajahn Brahm. And during the last rains retreat, before his passing away, he gets sick, yeah, because he has a physical body, so he gets sick like everyone else. That's the nature of a body. The Buddha is a human being, so he has exactly the same problems that we have. He gets sick, and Venerable Ananda, who is his very close attendant, he sees the sickness of the Buddha. And then Venerable Ananda, after the rains retreat, he goes up to the Buddha, and he says to the Buddha, Oh, Venerable Sir, my, I can't, the directions are unclear to me. I can't remember the teachings. Yeah, this is what happens when we kind of something really bad happens. We get confused, right? We fall into sadness and sorrow. We don't know up from down anymore, black from white. Everything kind of gets really confusing. Yeah, you know what it's like when some really difficult things happen. You lose your clarity. You don't really know what to do anymore. And this is happening to Venerable Ananda. And he is a stream winner, for goodness sake. He's a sotapanna. He doesn't see clearly. What about us? <laughs> Yeah, far more problematic. Yeah. And so uh, then what happens after this is that they kind of carry on there because they are walking. Yeah? And at a certain point, uh, the Buddha says to Venerable Ananda, and he says precisely this teaching I mentioned before. This is a very, for, for that reason, a very important and fundamental teaching. He says to Venerable Ananda, haven't I told you uh, that everything that is dear and pleasing to, uh, pleasing to us uh, must become separated from us. About it. Okay. <laughs> Maybe, yes, you probably have said that. He doesn't say yeah, He doesn't say anything. I'm just adding this for effect. But he's, you know, people kind of gets a bit uh, chastened, right? Uh, he's reminded by the Buddha what, uh, uh, what is actually going on. Uh, and then uh, the Buddha says, uh, yeah, and this is where this very famous saying comes in. Uh, and he says, you should be an island unto yourself. Uh, you should be a refuge, uh, take refuge in the Dhamma. Yeah, and what does that mean to be an island unto yourself? What does it mean to be, take a refuge in the Dhamma? And the Buddha says, what it means is to practice the four satipatthanas. What does it mean to practice the four satipatthanas? Well, basically, it means like mindfulness of breathing. It means closing your eyes, finding an internal refuge from the world where you can find peace, where you can find joy, satisfaction, happiness, contentment, all of these beautiful things in life. And that inner peace that you have available to yourself because you're withdrawing from the world outside, that is largely unshakable by the world because it is within you. Yeah, it is up to you if you can stabilize that and create that inner refuge for yourself. You have a place that the world cannot reach. Mara can't reach you anymore, right? Mara, the evil one, is kind of getting out, is starting to kind of despair. What am I going to do with these meditators from the BGF? They are getting out of my reach. Yeah. This is kind of the idea. And so you go into yourself. You find a refuge within, a place where the world can no longer reach. That is the beauty of the spiritual path. And everything we do on the spiritual path, yeah, from the generosity that we do, 
from the sila that we practice, uh, from the compassion and metta that we, deal, that we do on this path. I'm going to talk more about this later on. Uh, yeah, all of these things, they uh, have the same kind of idea of a refuge, but then also leading on to the deeper refuge, which is, as I just mentioned, the meditation itself, and ultimately taking you all the way to samadhi. And that is where you start to find your real home, as Venerable Ajahn Shah used to say, the real home inside of you. It's like a homecoming. You feel, yeah, this is what I've been looking for all along. This is the real deal. Now I feel finally at ease. Finally I have a real home for myself. All of these things I was searching for in the world, looking for things in the world, actually it is found in a completely different place. It is found by letting go of the world, going inside, and suddenly you find everything you ever wanted. That is your real home. Finally I'm home. And that reality that you find in meditation, even just a little bit of it, is so powerful and so beautiful compared to anything you can ever have anywhere else. That is the real refuge. And this is where this leads you. Yeah, if you think about these things in the right way, this is where it takes you, just as the Buddha was saying to Venerable Ananda. That's good news, isn't it? It's good news, but it's also not so easy because some of you say, oh, I've been trying to meditate for such a long time. Oh, it doesn't really work. What am I supposed to do? Yeah. So that means that you have to try again. It means you have to ask those difficult questions. Why isn't it working? What have I not been doing? Yeah. Because it will work if you get it right. The reason it's not working is because there's something you haven't uncovered yet. There's something you haven't done that you should be doing yet. And when these things come together, guaranteed it works. The Buddha guarantees that the Noble Eightfold Path works. And it works for everyone. There is no exception. Only, uh, the only kind of people it doesn't work for are the zombies. So if you're not a zombie, you're okay. So if you are a zombie, the door is over there, no need, no need to be here anymore. <laughs> you are, there's no hope if you have a zombie, because zombies don't, don't have a mind, yes? And if you are here to purify the mind, you can't purify something you haven't got, so that's uh, fair enough. So zombies, they have a kind of, uh, they, they don't have to be here. Huh? But zombies are, you know, not so common. Are there many zombies in, in Malaysia? Huh? Uh, yeah, yes. The <laughs> Three loaders, right? The zombies just walking around, not really, not really knowing what they're doing. That's, just, that's, a, that's a certain kind of zombie, yeah. I wasn't thinking of those zombies, but anyway, I know, I know what you mean, yeah. <laughs> so this is the idea of contemplation of death, yeah? It's a very powerful contemplation of impermanence. That's really what it comes down to, yeah? and it has a very transformative effect. So please uh, use these tools in your life. Don't forget about these things, yeah? Put a big sign. Uh, next to your bed. So when you wake up in the morning, it says, contemplate death. You see it straight away. Think, okay, I better contemplate <laughs> Yeah, Something like that. Because we need to be reminded sometimes. Uh, or do it in the evening before you go to bed. Actually, no. Before you go to bed in the evening, do metta. Because metta, uh, loving kindness, friendliness, that will make sure you sleep well. And then when you wake up in the morning, you will be ready for the death contemplation. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it goes. Uh. Okay, so uh, good. I'm glad I haven't. No, I didn't lose anyone. Sometimes when I talk about these things, people start walking out, and I say, "Oh, okay, enough." <laughs> Not because they're zombies, because they are they've had enough of the Buddhist teachings. So. But remember also, I think one very important thing about uh, the Buddhist teachings: uh, any teaching that is really worth its while, uh, any teaching that is powerful, uh, any teaching that is real spirituality, it should be challenging. Uh, if it is not challenging, it's kind of pointless, yeah? Because if it's not challenging, it means that everyone can understand it, everyone can grasp what is going on anyway. Yeah? So there's not, probably no point. So if you didn't feel challenged, I wouldn't be doing my job. So I want you to be challenged, yeah? I want you to be almost on the verge of walking out, but not quite, yeah? Sitting in your seat. Yeah? That's kind of what I want. Yeah? And because I too know that I have need, you know, sometimes to be challenged in my life. And if there's no challenges, there's no growth, nothing really happens. Yeah? So be glad that these things are challenging, yeah, because actually that is a part of the purpose of this. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, move on to some more of these contemplations. Yeah. So again, we are dealing with the contemplations. Uh, uh, this is the Buddha speaking. Yeah, yeah so uh, he's talking about what happened before he 
before his um, awakening here. So, uh, so it's when, uh, so this is again the noble path, right? We're dealing with a noble search now. Uh, so it's when someone who is themselves liable to sorrow, understanding the drawbacks in being liable to sorrow, seeks the freedom from sorrow, the supreme sanctuary from bondage, the bond, yeah, extinguishment. Extinguishment is nibbana. So uh, this is what it is. Uh, yeah, so the liable to sorrow, this is very similar to what I just said, the idea that uh, everything that is dear and beloved must become separated from me, yeah, is a very closely related to the idea of sorrowing. So um, you won't find this in, in exactly this way in the, in the uh, book because I have done things a bit differently on the screen there. So if you can't find it, it's not, because, not your fault, it's my fault. Uh, I, take for, <laughs> I take responsibility here. Yeah. So, uh, um, but we are on the Sutta number 26, Maja Malika, the Noble Search Sutta, still there. What page are we, are we on, those who know? Page 12, yeah, so those who, if you can't find it, page 12 there. So um, the idea here of sorrow is very closely related to this contemplation, yeah, that everything beloved and dear must become separated from you. That's where sorrow often arises, yeah, things becoming separated from us. So, so uh, understanding the drawbacks in being liable to sorrow, uh, I think that's probably quite obvious. Uh, yeah, we don't have to kind of try that hard, but what you have to do is you have to understand the nature of these things. Uh, you have to understand that it is unavoidable to live a human life without sorrow. That just doesn't happen. Maybe you can live without sorrow, but if you live without, without sorrow, it means you haven't you are completely insensitive to the world, yeah? And of course, if you are completely insensitive, if you are kind of slightly mentally out of deranged, and of course, then it's not going to be an issue. But that's even worse than having sorrow. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really get you anywhere. Yeah? So a normal human being will experience a degree of sorrow as part of life. And uh, how many, how much sorrow do you want to experience? Do you want to experience more sorrow? I had enough of sorrow. Enough of sorrow. Okay, good. Yeah, so you're on the, that means you're in the right place. And, um, you know, some of those very powerful teachings of the Buddha, they give you an idea of what it actually means to sorrow in a kind of samsaric context. Samsara is the kind of round of birth and death. They are going on and on and on forever. And uh, one of those kind of very powerful suttas found in, I think, in the Anamatagga Sangutta, in the uh, Sangutta Nikaya, Connected discourses of the Buddha, where he says that uh, you have cried in this long course of being dying and being reborn. Uh, you have cried more tears than there is than there's water in the four oceans. The four oceans are like the oceans around India. So it's not, not quite as big as the oceans of the world today, but not that far away either. Yeah, pretty, pretty close. So imagine that amount of tears. Have you calculated how many tears that is? How many tears go into the ocean? Okay, if you start counting, uh, the, how many, if in one lifetime, how, how many tears do you cry in one lifetime? It's like, how many liters in a lifetime? Uh? <laughs> we, should, we should try once. We should get someone when they are a baby and we should start collecting the tears. Uh, we should see how much it is, yeah? Then we can get some idea how much it is. Uh. So you, I, I have no idea. I guess it depends. Some people cry more than others. It's hard to know exactly. But say, say in one lifetime, maybe a lit one liter, is that enough? Huh? In one lifetime? Huh? What do people cry? It depends on the person, how much. Yeah? Maybe some more than that, some a little bit less. But a liter is already lots of tears, right? So there's one liter, and then how many liters in one cubic meter? So one cubic meter has a thousand liters, right? And then in a cubic kilometer, that's another, that's a thousand times uh, times a billion, that's a thousand billion liters, one trillion liters in a cubic kilometer. How many cubic kilometers in the ocean, the four oceans? Probably billions of cubic kilometers, right? So we're talking about a billion trillion liters of water tears. That's, that's a lot. Yeah, so this kind of, when you start kind of thinking about it like that, you start to realize that uh, there's been a lot of sadness in this life going on uh, when you kind of look at it from a big kind of scale. Uh. 
Yeah, so this is kind of the thing. And sometimes you get a glimpse into that reality. Huh? Sometimes maybe you remember a bit from your past life. Huh? Sometimes you understand the potential huh, for being reborn again in the future. Yeah? At that moment, when you see that potential, huh, you start to understand what the Buddha said about crying so much that it actually fills up the four oceans eventually. Huh? You start to see this potential. You start to see what's going on. Huh? And that is kind of... Uh, it gives you this kind of um, sense of wanting to withdraw from the whole sangsaric thing, uh, understanding how problematic it is. It gets this kind of repulsion. Uh, you get averse to the whole idea of existence uh, because you understand how problematic it is. Uh. So this, again, this idea of sorrowing. Uh, and I, I know that many of these things that you know, these things already, you've heard them before. Uh, but it's not just these things should not only be heard once. Uh, and you need to kind of hear them again, because you need to reflect on them. You need to kind of understand, what does it mean for me? What does it actually mean, these facts, yeah, that I, you know, you are liable to sorrow? What does actually, how does this pan out in terms of the overall of samsaric existence? What does this mean in terms of death and all of these things? And sometimes these things, they sink in a little bit deeper. This is the idea of contemplating these things, allowing them this gradual sinking in to understand what it means. And eventually, they become a source of joy because you understand there is an alternative. An alternative is the spiritual path. That is the way out. Not only is it the way out, but it gives enormous joy and happiness in this very life, right here and right now, if you do it well. So never think that you've heard these things enough. You haven't heard it enough. And if you keep coming to my retreats, you're going to hear it again. <laughs> just warning you, just so you make it, make it clear. So, um, I think time for a little bit of meditation. Ajahn? Ah, um, this morning when I meditate, uh, suddenly I can hear my own snoring. What to do next? You, you can hear your voice? I can hear myself snoring. Snoring? You can say snoring. Okay, what to do next? Okay. What to do next? Carry on snoring. Yeah, that's what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, sometimes these things happen, you fall asleep. But it's quite common. You hear someone, especially at the back of the room, that's often when they fall asleep. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I just think, oh, it's nice. I feel kind of a sense of compassion when people snore, you know, because it means that they're really relaxing and just kind of taking it easy. Yeah. So it's actually a good sign usually. But just allow yourself to snore a little bit, and then after a while you stop snoring, and then you can, can carry on with your meditation afterwards. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Everyone is happy? Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's good. Uh. You don't have to ask questions. It's okay not to ask questions too, so uh, that's fine. Uh. So, uh... <clears throat> okay. <laughs>